The title of my paper is Making of, of a Counter Environment. And it's uh, a brief summary of, a, of an argument that I put in a book that I recently published and co-authored with a good friend, uh, Carmine Tabone. And uh, the title of the book is Arts and Play as Educational Media in the Digital Age. And I think it follows quite well the, uh, the presentation uh, that the young woman just made. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, and I'll begin by stating the obvious. We live in a most peculiar and unsettling time. In a matter of a few decades, the digital revolution has seized control of virtually every institution of modern life, fundamentally altering the ways in which we walk, how we talk, how we play, how we travel, how we study, how we eat, how we meet, how we shop, how we exercise, how we date, how we mate, and even how we sleep. Media colleges from Mumford to McLuhan to Postman saw something like this coming. But one has to wonder if even these visionaries would have not been shocked by the radical transformations that we live every day. Children sitting in the front row seat of this runaway roller coaster ride are in a especially vulnerable position. They are new to the world and they have not yet internalized the habits of mind that come with literacy, nor have they fully absorbed the intricacies of oral face-to-face -face communication. Their world since the day they were born has largely been a digital one. The prominent place of digital media in their lives will surely continue as technologies grow exponentially in sophistication, availability, and variety of use. We are not at the end of the digital revolution. We're not even in the middle of it. We're only at the very beginning. And so in my paper today, I will briefly outline a strategy that seeks to offer a counterbalance to the dominance of digital revolution in the lives of children. Based on 40 years of work with children in Jersey City, this proposal is not intended as a cure-all, but merely a step in a, a saner and more rational direction. Rather than call for the elimination of digital media, clearly an impossibility, even if it were desirable, I will maintain that children need to be exposed to non-digital, non-electronic experiences that cultivate alternative ways of thinking, feeling, and being in the world. This is not an original idea, but one that is part and parcel of the media ecology tradition. As a defense mechanism against the naturalizing or normalizing of technology, media ecologists have often suggested the creation of strategies to act as countermeasures. Usually described as counter environments, these measures consist of alternative, alternative experiences, spaces, and perspectives that allow us to distance ourselves from the sway of the dominant technologies in order to ponder, question, and study their consequences. It is only by being outside of the bubble that we can see inside the bubble. But how do you create a counter environment in the lives of children that can hope to compete with the powerful lore of the digital? In our work with children, we have found that hands-on experiences in the arts, such as dance and movement, and interpersonal face-to-face -face forms of play create patterns of interaction that actively oppose the behaviors, biases, and habits of digital media. To better understand how this happens and why this happens, it is helpful to think of counter environments as operating in ways that parallel the operation of a seesaw. Just as a seesaw functions and can only function if there is a counterbalance of similar weight sitting at the other end of the plank, a counter environment in the classroom can only work if it carries a weight sufficient enough to counterbalance the media which weighs so heavily in the lives of children. If there is no opposition, then there is no balance. There is nothing that is truly counter. And so when school boards speak of integrating digital technology across the curriculum, as so many of them do, the seesaw principle is being violated. What they are actually advocating in such a case 
is merely adding more weight to an already enormous heavily body at one end of the seesaw while leaving the other side vacant. There is no counterweight. There is no counter environment. There is only more of the same dressed up in fancier, bulkier, and more expensive clothing. There's a vain expectation to think that more technology will somehow balance the problems brought about by more technology. But the, sec but the presence of an opposing weight is not sufficient to bring balance into the classroom. A second point the seesaw principle helps us to understand is that in constructing an effective counter environment, it is not enough for the weight just to be counter. It also needs to be an alternative that, genu ge that generates genuine engagement. Literacy alone, as advocated by Neil Postman, is not enough because it cannot hope to compete with the immediacy, the dazzling imagery, the convenience, and all the powerful seductions of the digital environment. This is where the arts and play come to the fore. Children are quite naturally drawn to the joy and excitement of games, singing, dancing, uh, drawing, painting, storytelling, and playing make-believe. If one can channel this energy and direct it towards educational goals, then a classroom can become a vibrant counter-environment that balances some of the weight of the digital media. And this brings me to my third and final point. If hands-on experiences in the arts and interactive forms of play cultivate qualitatively different experiences than those cultivated by digital media, and if they do have a powerful appeal for children, can they also be employed in ways that benefit the social, emotional, and academic development of children? Perhaps a couple of examples will su su suffice to make my point. At a time when digital media create experiences that fragment, accelerate, and immediately gratify, the arts can be employed to reduce the speed of information, bring a common focus, and solidified group process. Group singing on a regular basis, for example, is a deceptively simple activity that engages us in a very complex social and emotional uh, process. Whereas digital media cultivate us as listeners of song, Group singing engages us as creators of it. At the same time, the process of singing improves memory, expands vocabulary, and cultivates a focused attention. Experienced on a regular basis during childhood, singing becomes as natural as breathing, and we are much less likely to be inhibited by the shame that many of us feel later in life at the thought of actually raising our voices in song. Above all, group singing is a joyful experience that generates a great deal of collective happiness. The simple act of singing releases endorphins and creates a feeling of well-being. In sum, when children start off each morning with a song, they are counterbalancing the biases of digital media and taking a step in a direction which will reverberate throughout the day. As that great American philosopher James Durante once said, you got to start off each day with a song. All right. no. uh, the arts and play can also be used to develop a love of literacy and stimulate the processes of crit critical thinking to the incorporation of drama. Now, by drama, I do not mean putting on a play with assigned parts, memorized lines, and battles before an appreciative audience but a much more basic exploration of a child's natural desire to play make-believe. Just as we have all played make-believe as children, children today are still compelled to act out stories and scenarios they have seen, heard, or read about. With a little bit of imagination and effort, the simple act of playing pretend can become an opportunity for deeper and more varied forms of learning. By placing children in role as characters in an unfolding and flexible story, teachers can guide students through situations where they're led to converse, ask questions, listen, remember details, verbalize objections, argue, debate, write, and discuss, just as the characters would they are playing and bring it to life in the classroom environment. Moreover, when the teacher places herself within the drama, as a pivotal character in the story, she is in a position to challenge the students, elevate their language, 
provoke them and guide them, guide the drama in several different directions. One such workshop that I developed for fifth graders in Jersey City was based on the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast of 1938. In the unfolding drama workshop, children imagine themselves in various roles, including that of reporters, eyewitnesses, scientists, and members of a public frightened by an invasion from Mars. In role as reporters, children write down a list of questions to ask the noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, played by the teacher in role, who will be coming to the classroom to discuss the possibility of life on the planet Mars. Children also interview other students who act as eyewitnesses to the event. Students then write and edit reports for a pretend newscast in front of the room and prepare articles and artwork for inclusion in a newspaper they create amongst themselves. In closing, please understand me correctly. The argument of our book is not, is not that the arts and play are a cure-all for a situation that is clearly getting out of hand. They are merely an effective step in a saner and more balanced direction. Moreover, we are not arguing that digital media are evil or that they need to be eliminated. Bill Gates does not need to be disemboweled and Elon Musk does not need to be sent into orbit along with his spaceship. But at the very least, grant us this, digital media call out, they even scream out for some sort of balance. The seesaw of a child's education and socialization is far too slanted in favor of the 800 pound gorilla we call the digital revolution. The arts in play experience as tactile, interactive, social activities can help rebalance and recalibrate the media environment of childhood. They have the weight, they have the appeal, and they have the pedagogical potential to act as a vibrant counter environment in the lives of children. The seesaw needs to be, and the seesaw can be, brought into balance. Thank you.